Hi everyone, in just two minutes, I'm gonna be interviewing Katherine Ryan Hyde. And this is my first interview for the year, and I am so excited that it's her because she writes the most amazing books. And we're gonna be talking about her newest book called The Wake Up, but in case you guys don't know who she is, she wrote the book Pay It Forward that ended up being that blockbuster movie back in 2000. That was her, and um, I love her books. Okay, this story is crazy good, and I can't wait to talk to her about it. So um, I will be talking to you after the interview and uh, talking with you about how much I love her again, but, and I am going to really shamelessly beg her to do another interview on a book she had out last year called Allie and Bia, or B, I think it is. Um, I will ask her about that, but, uh, cause she had two books released last year. This is her newest one. And this just came out in December. So anyway, guys, I am so excited. I'll talk to you later. Hi everyone. I am so excited to be speaking for the first, my first interview of the year is with Catherine Ryan Hyde. And we're going to be talking about her book, The Wake Up. And also I'm very excited to be announcing that this is going to be a podcast. So if you are watching this and you'd rather listen, you can go over to iTunes and look up Writing Fun. And if you are listening and you'd rather watch it, um, and see her amazing book cover and, you know, watch it on your computer, then you can go over to the YouTube channel. But anyway, thank you so much, Catherine. This is the way to start off my year is talking to you. Good morning. Yeah, it's a better way for me to start it than, you know, writing a check and putting 2017, <laughs> which is probably the next thing I'll do. <laughs> right. I was so, I read this book over the holidays. And, okay. uh, you know, I was so excited about it. I mean, okay. your books, I am never, ever disappointed by your books, okay? That's and to hear. <laughs> Never. You do not disappoint. And I knew it was going to be amazing, and it was amazing. And I have so much because what I love about your characters, the last time we talked was about Say Goodbye for Now, and that was last year. And in yeah. the meantime, you've released Alien B. Is that how you're going to say it? I didn't yeah. know whether it's B or B. B. Okay. Oh no, it's B. B. Right. I thought so, but I just didn't want to. I didn't want to mess it up. But um, anyway, I wanted to talk to you about that one, and I never got around to you know getting to you because I had so much going on when that book came out last year, um, and then this book came out, and I was like, oh my gosh, I have to talk to her about this book. I have, there's no choice. So anyway, and then you agreed, and I was so so happy because this book. <laughs> Okay, your characters always, not just one of them, I can relate in my life to absolutely all the characters in the book. So <laughs> that's what happened the last time. I was like, how does she do that? How does she do that? I can relate to the stories and relate to the characters, and it doesn't matter what time you put them in or where you put them, I relate to them. Well, that's a hard <laughs> question. Um, but I know. I think... Well, yeah, the bottom line is I have no idea how any of this works. I mean, I sit down and type words, and then people, you know, reflect on them, and I'm like, really? It did all that? But but I, I honestly think that, uh, I mean, I do have theories about this. I am of the opinion that uh, we are all human, and we share almost identical sets of emotions. Now, I know it seems like what we're feeling is very different, but I think it's really only different in terms of things like how we direct it, what we say it's really about, whether we um, embrace it or deny it. Basically, I think we're walking around with the same sets of reactions to the world and just very different ways of expressing that. And so what I try to do when I write a story is I try to just get underneath all those differences and just write how it feels to be human. So if that works and it and it hits somebody like you who who is kind of, you know, in, in touch with that very human part of yourself, then hopefully it's going to make a connection because we're all human. Does that make sense? That It totally makes sense. But That's kind of what you... I'm trying for. Yeah, and but you do it. I mean, I read a lot of books, 
And since our last interview, when I was listening to it this morning, just to refresh what we talked about, I have almost the exact same comment that I did about the other book. And I was like, see, she does this. This is what you do. Is that they're very <laughs> different books. And they are. And yes, for yeah. anyone who hasn't read both of them, they are completely different stories. Yeah. They are in a Although different I time. I actually think that The Wake Up and Say Goodbye for Now possibly have more in common than uh, Allie and B. Well, which I think was a little bit lighter, which is kind of a weird thing to say because it's about, you know, homelessness among the elderly and a girl who was almost, you know, sold into, you know, slavery, but, um, you know, trafficked. And so it has some very heavy topics in it, and yet the feeling of the two getting to know each other is a little bit lighter. So I don't know. I may be full of it because <laughs> I'm looking at this. Well, you know, there's that old joke about the the painter on the scaffold. They say the problem is you can't step back and get any perspective on your work. Right. I mean, I'm probably the least qualified person in the world to make observations like that about what I write. Right. And that, yeah, because you're too close. And that's why it's like you need readers, especially someone like me who reads a lot of books, to be able to tell you that what you have with characters is special. And how I fell into the story of Say Goodbye for Now in almost the exact way that I fell in love with The Wake Up and, and yet completely different way. I mean, it, so for, you know, let's just do a little bit of a synopsis for everybody. Um, I, the, the story is the main character is Aiden, okay? I would call him the main character, even though I related more with Gwen at certain times, but I'm going to call Aiden the main character. <laughs> so, you know, here is this guy, and he's very aware of himself. What I, what I think is, like, he's very aware of his own emotions, more so than normal 40-year-old men, I think, and he sees things and feels things so uniquely, and, and he ends up, uh, he, in the beginning, he has a girlfriend, and um, that doesn't work out so well, and he hooks up with this single mom, Gwen, and what I love about him, is the reason I felt like I related with this story so much is because I was a single mom, and I had, back in my day, I've raised six children, but back in the day, I had three children. And I almost went through this exact same situation. So I was looking at it, except for, of course, I loved Aiden way more because he handled it so much better in the book than what I went through. But, um, you know, trying to be a stepdad, I should say, trying to figure out how to become a part of this woman's life. And um, and then, of course, she has a special son, Milo. And, um, and just to put it out there is – I was Milo. I was I was um, sexually abused as a child. So right away, I related with him and, you know, connected with him. And, and it was – my story is different than his, but I really – the way you wrote him and the things he was going through was so perfect, absolutely perfect. Well, one thing I want to mention just to, to throw a little bit extra in with your synopsis is – you know, you say he's more in touch, you know, with what he's feeling. And, well, the the main thrust of the book is that he's in touch with what other people are feeling, people right. and animals. And, but when, when, the, when his story starts, he's not at all. He is completely shut down to everything. And then he has that experience that he refers to as the wake-up where he can't hold it in anymore. And that's why his relationship with his girlfriend doesn't work out. I mean, she... She goes from being frustrated that she can't get through to him and has no idea what he's feeling to now he taps back into the sensitivity and just kind of loses everybody and everything. You know, he's a cattle rancher. That doesn't help. <laughs> I, yeah, and I loved how he was feeling everything because, I, you know, I was, wanted to talk to you about that concept of, you know, where you came up with because I do think that that exists. I don't think it's that – you know, when he goes to see the counselor and he wants to know, like, you know, what is wrong with me because I have all these feelings, is it just me? And she says it it may be, it may not be, because I think that there are people that just don't talk about it, and he was oh, yeah. willing to talk about it, you know? Yeah. Well, that's one of the reasons, actually, why I brought up that thing about how he was completely shut down to his emotions and then they woke up, because when I see somebody who's being unemotional, 
I kind of wonder, is that person really unemotional or is that person so emotional that they've built a wall between themselves and what mm-hmm. they could be feeling? Those are the kind of uh, questions that keep a novelist in business. But uh, to answer your question, I have no idea where this stuff comes from. I mean, I'm sure stuff gets into my head from from my own not when I say my own experience, I don't mean any anything I really did or whatever or anybody I really knew. I'm not saying that makes it into my books. But just general observations about myself and others in human nature. I'm sure that gets in at the back of my head. But I really this is so pure imagination. People don't get how much it's pure imagination probably because their imagination isn't in overdrive like this. But basically I, do. I just I'm I open myself to an idea, like just purely out of imagination. And the one that came to me in this case is a guy who's out hunting and he shoots a deer and he feels it like he was the one who was shot. That that's, that's how the whole thing started. And then I just basically have to find a whole story to go with that. Yeah, and that's what I was thinking, because usually when I'm reading this, I think, okay, what did she go through to get to this? You know, because I really feel like you had to have... I mean, (laughs) I I do think that that I am probably an empath at, at a far lower volume than my character in this book. I mean, right, I, but I, I do think, think that too. always had a certain access to, you know, like for example, if someone, uh, if someone walks into a room who has a kind of a disturbed energy, I feel like I need to leave the room, or I don't want that person sitting next to me, because I can't entirely keep from sponging that emotion. Right. But that's kind of where the thing ends. I mean, other than that, I don't share any experiences in common with Aiden. Interesting. Because like I said, I... People, people don't have characters running around in their head. So, like, the the most common question I get is, you know, is this somebody you really knew? No, I don't base characters on anybody I really knew. Uh, first of all, they need to be a lot more interesting than real life. Um, and second of all, I just I don't go I I don't go around looking for stories around me. I look inside where imagination lives. And like I say, that's the kind of thing that's a little bit hard to explain. And I'm sure that you know, like when I was a a kid, I used to daydream. And I actually had a teacher to tell me if I didn't stop it, I'd never make anything of myself. So I wish I knew where he was because I would have to get the last laugh at him. Oh, that's awesome. Um, but, that's awesome. you know, so it. I'm not saying everybody's mind works that way. Definitely everybody's mind doesn't. But um, for me, it's really a process of pure imagination. And and as I as I imagine out these stories and as they take shape and take on more weight, it feels less like I'm making stuff up and more like I'm discovering what happened. Like when I get a piece of it, I'll go, oh, yeah, that's how it was. That's how it feels anyway. Dad, I love that. I really do. I love that because that's kind of how it cut. Like I said, if, it, if you didn't experience it yourself in order, you know, as you're writing it, you're experiencing it and going, oh, yeah. Okay, yes. you know, that makes sense. That's what happened. And well, with the part Aiden, of it that I've experienced is being human, lost in the world, which can be a very scary place, with a full set of human emotions. That's how I'm able to make it feel real. Right. But that's, that's as far as my experience uh, crosses over with the characters. Well, I love that... With Aiden, because of what he went through, and I think that that empath in him came, you know, that's what happened, like that he became attuned to because when he starts watching Milo, it's almost like he's connecting in a way with him that, you know, that not everybody, not every man is going to have that kind of a connection. But I love the connection with him. And the, the common theme, you know, in Say Goodbye For Now and with this one that I found is, how you use animals to heal. 
And I love that because I do think that animals are very healing um, for any, it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't have to be any kind of abuse. They're just, they're the, they're, they're what I used to always say, like I, when I was at my worst in my life, I always turned to my animals. You know, it was like they, they understood it somehow. You know, even growing up, I had a dog that was my dog. And, you know, if I had a bad day, what did I do? I went home and told my dog and, and he just listened and sat on my lap and loved me and, and greeted me when I came in the door. You know, there's a, there's a healing that kids get that they don't even, I don't even know why I did it. Why did I, you know, like, how do we understand that as children? But we do. Well, we feel love. I mean, nobody has to explain it to us. Right. I mean, we feel love. We, I mean, love is so natural to us as children that somebody has to give us a little stuffed toy to hug so that we have something to put all our love into. Mm, right. Think about that. Yes. Yeah. You give kids dolls and teddy bears because they are so full of love that they have to have an object to which they can express it. I love that. I never really thought of that. That's amazing. You know, kids almost anthropomorphize their little toy because they they just have so much love. And when yeah. something something or someone loves you, you gravitate toward that. Right. Right. So as children, you know, when you feel, you know, we even know as adults how much love we feel from our for our dogs, but as children, you like see this, you know, this dog coming up to you and just greeting you and looking so happy and wagging its tail, and you're like, oh my gosh, look at how much he loves me, you know. Yeah. So I, yeah, I, I love that common theme. I mean, of course, you can tell that um, from <laughs> from your Facebook page about your dogs, which I love. Okay, like and what cat, animal lover horse. you are. Excuse me, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. And and cat and horse. And cat and horse. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and anyone who wants my to see horse pictures, loves me. yes, we go on her my website. Horse adores me, and and pretty much everybody else too. I mean, I think he likes me better than most. But <laughs> he loves cats, he loves dogs, he loves people, he loves kids, he he loves other horses. He's just a very affectionate guy. Right? Did you grow up with horses? Um, I took riding lessons when I was young. Um, I I. I wanted a horse, but my parents weren't in a financial position to get me one. But I did take English riding lessons for many years. And then I went a different direction, you know, grew up and moved to the city and blah, blah, blah. And then when I first came to Cambria, this little rural town where I live now, village, um, I had a horse for about six years. And then, uh, and then when, right around the time I turned 60, about three years ago, um, I got a horse again, figuring if I was going to do it again, I better hurry up and do it because, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Well, I saw pictures of it on your website, and he's very cute. The horse? Yes. Yeah, he's a real nice guy. And I've not been around horses. I, that is not – I'm in Pennsylvania, and um, I really I, – I rode a horse one time, uh, we went up to the mountains, and my mom and I did, and that was it. You know, that was my experience. It's just not a common thing in our area. Um, but right. she actually was the one who was like, I want to ride a horse. And I was like, okay, let's go do that. And so we, you know, we went to uh, somebody who showed us what to do, and they took us on a trail. And, um, and you know, we never did it again, but I was like, I, you know, I love looking at them. And I love when I see people with their horses. And I think it must be the same thing, you know, as you get with a dog and a cat. I mean, there must be the same kind of energy that they give it, off. It is, but it's actually even a little bit more complex because you have to accomplish something together. You you have to you have to be able to ride this animal safely. You have to be able to direct him. You have to be able to do things kind of as one. Hmm. Um, and so it's actually even a little bit more, I think, more complex because you don't simply commune with each other. You you actually have to have this level of training where you understand each other so well 
to do what you need to do and be safe. And there has to be so much trust between you. Hmm. It's 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 really it's it's one of those things that people. I, I mean, I've actually never had a. I have no children, but it's actually I think a lot like having a child in that you have no idea what you're getting into until you get into it. However complex you think it's going to be, however you think it's going to stretch you, you are in for a big surprise. And and I love in this book you really take uh, someone like me through the relationship with the children and the horses and how you know they got connect from the time they're born and he you know so I really feel like I know a lot about it now because you do go into a lot of detail not through it, not just Aiden but you know with Milo also and Elizabeth especially Elizabeth too and. Um, so I really did understand that, you know, when when they're first born, how you wanted the children to connect with them at that point on, you know, I thought that was beautiful. Sorry, I probably should say something to that. But I <laughs> no, I'm just, you know, I give it a pause because, you. <laughs> because I did, I, I really did. I love that. I love that part of the story. And um it, it was amazing, and I learned so much about you. I went on your website. I mean, you are amazing. This is your 34th book, okay? And yes. you write two books a year, basically, right? I'm working on number 37. <gasps> wow. 35 and 36 are in production, and I'm I'm actually working on 37. That's, I mean, that is a and lot of... that's just the published ones. That's not counting anything that got put in a drawer. <laughs> I mean, that is just an amazing schedule to keep up, you know, I, you can say it one year, like, oh, I wrote two books, or I had two books come out, but I mean, year after year, that is your schedule, and then on top of all that, you, you go traveling, and you have pictures, and you've been hiking, uh, you went hiking on the Himalayas, I mean, Grand Canyon, I Actually, love pictures. Actually, I'm going to go traveling, as a matter of fact, I'm going to be leaving in less than two weeks. And I'm going, going to a place north of the Arctic Circle. Uh, <gasps> hope you see the aurora. The, oh, this is hard to say. Aurora, aurora. Borealis. You're right. Oh my goodness. Oh, where are you going to see that? Pardon? Where do you where do you see that? I mean, I've heard of it, but where do you see that? Well, the farther north you go, the better. Oh, I'm okay. I'm actually going to Finland, but uh, the the you know just the farther you go toward the poles, the more likely you are. Wow. Uh, it and also, of course, the darker and more wintry it is, the more likely you are to see it. So I will be cold. You will be cold. I'm thinking about the fact that right now it's seven degrees out in Pennsylvania, and well, <laughs> very... and the interesting thing is that it's actually warmer than that where I'm going. I've been watching the um, the Weather Channel for these cities in Finland, and they're actually quite balmy compared to the eastern United States right now. Wow. I think, uh, well, I actually haven't looked for a day or two, but a couple days ago it was like 30-something in Helsinki. And and it's like, it's seven here in Pennsylvania. So. Yeah, <laughs> and 20 below in, I don't know, wherever, but Minneapolis, or, yeah. Wow, that's really I grew up in that's... Buffalo, New York, so it's not oh. that I've never experienced that... <laughs> you I have. have. You but have. I, I didn't grow up yesterday, let me tell you. Right, right. Well, you know, ago. that area, I've only driven through that area a um, couple of times, but right now they just got so much snow in the Buffalo, Erie area. Like, it well, they, are, they do. I mean, that's your snow belt <laughs> right. area. That's what Buffalo is famous for. It gets that lake effect snow. Yes, they get that lake effect. And I was hearing My people. My father's still there somewhere buried under that blanket. <laughs> I heard people, I know people that live near there, and they were saying for, you know, the holidays, they couldn't even get in, you know, and those people are used to snow. It isn't like, you know, we're talking about the six inches or a foot, you know, dissuades them from moving around. I mean, they actually were, you know, a little landlocked at the moment, but <laughs> I hope they're getting out. So, yeah, me anyway. too. <laughs> so, which is, okay, so this book came out in December. The wake up December fifth, yeah. December fifth. So when is your the next one going to be coming out? It's in May, and I don't have the 
date right in front of me, but it's already uh, it's already up for pre-order on Amazon. It's got a little synopsis, but it doesn't yet have the uh, cover. It's called Heaven Adjacent, mm. um, and 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 it's May something. It might be the twelfth. I'm I'm going off the top of my head here. Okay, awesome. I can't. Normally, I, I can't. have one come out in May and one come out in December. Okay. Yeah, that's right, because the other one, yeah, I I can't wait, Catherine. <laughs> I love your books so much. I, I really, I can't wait. And I do love the titles of your books. I mean, um, I went through them today, and I was like, you have, do you come up with the titles yourself? I do, but there was a while there, um, there was a while there when my books were being published, first in the U.K., long story not worth going into. Okay. And they were very, uh, oh, boy, they just wanted you to hit their readership with just the right tone. And so I would have to keep coming up with titles and coming up with them and coming up with them and coming up with them until they would accept one. And unfortunately, what they were looking for was a kind of like a, I, I'm using the word soft, they didn't kind of like a okay. soft, mushy narrative title, like When I Found You, Take Me With You, Don't Let Me Go. Uh, right. And the problem right. with those titles is they all start to sound alike. So since I've been with my new publisher, and, and uh, like the last, I think, it's, I think this is the 10th, 10th or 11th, I think this is the 10th that I've put out with Lake Union. Um, they are more open. I, I, the title still has to work for them. And sometimes marketing will still say, I'm not so sure about this title, and maybe we'll come up with something different. But fortunately, I haven't had a publisher literal, literally retitle a book for me because that can happen. Well, I, you know, what I was looking at, and I, I'm looking at your website right now because I wanted to see some of them. I mean, say goodbye for now. I, I love the title of that book. This one, The Wake Up. I mean, it, it's perfect with the cover. The cover is absolutely beautiful. Um, I encourage everybody to go look at this cover because it, it's, it's – I mean, and I'm looking at it on a computer. I can't wait to see it, you know, because I, did, I was uh, listening to it, and I read it on my Kindle, which right. also the audio is amazing. Um, I don't know how much of a say you have with that, but, you know, Actually, listening to the I, audio. When I, have, uh, when I have a book going to audio that has – uh, a, a male narration, like a, a male viewpoint character, I mm-hmm. actually ask for Nick Podell by name. Oh, because I nice. really like his work. I really oh. like the way yeah. he reads the things. He he really gets it. Like every sentence comes out the way I heard it in my head. I, the slight I thought sarcasm so too. comes out of slight sarcasm. The slight, he always puts the emphasis on the word that I'm hearing emphasized in my head. He, you know, he never kind of does a thing where I go, really? That's how you thought that? You know what I mean? Like, he just gets it. And and that's awesome because I know a lot of authors who won't listen. If they didn't get a say, they don't want it ruined. You know, like, and then I tell them, I'm like, no, it's really good. You should listen to it. But, you know. Well, I always I'm, listen to the audio in, in its entirety when it comes out because I want to hear. I thought he did a great job. I loved his, I could tell the characters apart. I could, you know, I thought he did a great job. Yeah. Especially One when of the you're things driving. I like about him is that I like the way he reads the voices of female characters. Mm-hmm. He makes them sound feminine, but he doesn't do it in a silly, stereotypical way. Yes. He yes, doesn't I do agree. it with a silly, high, and substantial voice. And yet he, somehow he brings out that feminine quality. Yes. In her voice without overdoing it. I agree. I I thoroughly enjoyed listening to him. You know, I never got tired of it. And I did read most of it, but I did enjoy the time that I was listening to him a lot. So if that's how you like to, you know, read your books, if you're traveling and you like to listen to the audio, I highly encourage listening to this audio. Yeah, that's actually how I do most of my reading is by is by audio book. I, I'm finding I'm doing it more and more. Limited, you know. Yeah. Five times a week, writing two books a year. <laughs> what I do is I just turn my commute time into my reading time. Me too. That's exactly what I do. Since I'm having to do, you know, read so quote unquote read so many books, I just turn my commute 
into, you know, when yeah. I'm going to listen. And that's just, that works. And if I have to drive a long distance, that works too. Then I get the whole book in. So it makes me happy doing that too. But anyway, thank you so much, Catherine. You are my first podcast person, and I'm so happy about that. And I hope it's a terrific <laughs> year of podcasts for you. <laughs> thank you. I got it off um, to start. Yes, and I can't wait for your book. What, what is the title of the one coming out in May? I don't know if we said it. Uh, Heaven Adjacent. Oh, yeah, we did. Heaven Adjacent. Yes, I am looking forward to that. Maybe we can chat about that one in May because I would yeah. love to talk to you again. Yeah. Yes, and um, have a happy new year. And I, I know this book is already, I mean, it's doing amazing things on Amazon. I saw all the reviews and, you know, people are loving it. So I am so happy for you. Well, thank you very much. I was glad to get together and talk about it. Yes, me too. Have a great year and a great day. I'll talk yeah, to you later. Yes, you too. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, and I'm back. I just finished talking to Catherine. Um, it was amazing. I think we talked over a half an hour. I try to keep it under a half an hour, but she has amazing stories about not just about her books, but her life. And um, I will have all of her links underneath here. And I just wanted to show you because I had listened to this book and read it on Kindle as a whisper sync. But look at the cover for her newest book, The Wake Up. Isn't that beautiful? I just love it. And um, she does two books a year. This was out, this book came out in December and uh, we talk about that. And, um, you know, we just talk about her writing style and, and her horses and her dogs. And, you know, she loves talking about her animals. And um, I am so, so grateful that she likes talking to me. And this interview will be on my podcast, which um, is just being loaded. This is the first interview I did for that will be loaded um, as a video and a podcast um, that I talk about. I think um, Kyle may be doing another one, a couple, maybe loading a couple into the podcast before this, but this one has the introduction and, and um, I'm so excited for this year to be able to have a podcast. And I am so grateful that Catherine talked to me. I love her. Her writing is amazing. Guys, get, she has, this was her 34th book and she's writing her 37th book at the moment. Okay. I mean, two a year consistently. Um, her stories never disappoint. So anyway, um, if you liked listening to Catherine and, um, and you like this video, uh, hit like, and, uh, if you'd like to subscribe, hit subscribe and, uh, we will talk with you soon. Thank you so much for listening. Bye.